And uh, you started talking about uh, Dave Romahart. So who is this person that yeah. was so, uh, you've spoken very highly of him. Yeah. Can you tell me about him, his ideas, his mind, uh, who he was as a human being, yeah. as a scientist? So Dave came from a little tiny town in Western South Dakota. And uh, his mother was the librarian and his father was the editor of the newspaper. Um, and, uh, I know one of his brothers pretty well. Um, they grew up, there were four brothers, uh, and, uh, they grew up together, uh, and their father encouraged them to compete with each other a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, they competed in sports and they competed in mind games, you know, um, I don't know, things like Sudoku and chess and uh, various things like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh. Dave um, was uh, a standout undergraduate. He went uh, as at a younger age than most people do to college at the University of South Dakota and majored in mathematics. And I don't know how he got interested in psychology, but he um, applied to the mathematical psychology program at Stanford and was accepted as a PhD student to study mathematical psychology at Stanford. So mathematical psychology uh, is the use of mathematics to model mental processes. Right? So something that I think these days might be called cognitive modeling, that whole space. Yeah, it's mathematical in the sense that um, you say, if this is true and that is true, then I can derive that this should follow. Okay, and so you say, these are my stipulations about the fundamental principles, and this is my prediction about behavior, and it's all done with equations. It's not done with a computer simulation, mm -hmm. right? So the, the, you, you solve the equation, and that tells you what the probability that the subject will be correct on the seventh trial of the experiment is, or something like that, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, use of mathematics to descriptively characterize uh, aspects of, of behavior. And uh, Stanford at that time was the place where uh, there were several really, really strong mathematical thinkers who were also connected with three or four others around the country who um, you know brought a lot of really exciting ideas uh, onto the table. And it was a very, very prestigious, part of the field of psychology at that time. So Rommel Hart comes into this. Um, he was a very strong student within that program. Uh, and uh, he got this job at this brand new university in San Diego in 1967, where he's one of the first assistant professors in the department of psychology uh, at UCSD. So I got there in 74, seven years later, and Rommelhart at that time was still doing mathematical modeling, um, but he had gotten interested in cognition. He'd gotten interested in understanding, and, you know, understanding, I think, remains, you know, what does it mean to understand anyway, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's it's an interesting sort of curious, you know, like how would we know if we really understood something? But, but he was interested in building machines that would, you know, hear a couple of sentences and have an insight about what was going on. So for example, one of his favorite things at that time was, um, Marky was sitting on the front step when she heard the familiar jingle of the good humor man. She remembered her birthday money and ran into the house. What is Marky doing? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, there's a couple of ideas you could have, but the most natural one is that the good humor man brings ice cream. She likes ice cream. She's she knows she needs money to buy ice cream, so she's going to run into the house and get her money so she can buy herself an ice cream. Mm -hmm. It's a huge amount of inference that has to happen to mm -hmm. get those things to link up with each other. 
And, and he was interested in how the hell that could happen. And he was trying to build, um, you know, good old fashioned AI style uh, models of representation of language and and content of, you know, things like has money. <laughs> so like lo or like formal logic and like knowledge bases, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So he was integrating that with his thinking about cognition. Yes. So the mechanisms of cognition, how can they like mechanistically be applied to build these knowledge, like to actually build something that looks like a web of knowledge and thereby from from there emerges something like understanding, whatever yeah. the heck that is. Yeah, but he was thing. grappling. The, this was something that they grappled with at the end of that book that I was describing, Explorations in Cognition. Mm -hmm. But he was realizing that the paradigm of good old-fashioned AI wasn't giving him the answers to these questions. Yeah. And By the way, that's called good old-fashioned AI now. It was called that <laughs> at the time. Well, it was. It was beginning to be called that. Uh, oh, because it was from the 60s. Yeah, like yeah. By, by, by the late 70s, it was kind of old-fashioned, and it hadn't really <laughs> panned out, you know, and yeah. people were beginning to recognize that. But uh, and and Rommel Hart was you know like yeah he was part of the recognition that this wasn't all working anyway so he um, started thinking in terms of uh, the idea that we needed systems that allowed us to integrate multiple simultaneous constraints in a way that would be mutually influencing each other so. Um, he wrote a paper that just really, first time I read it, I thought, oh, well, you know, yeah, but is this important? But after a while, it just got under my skin. And it, it was called an interactive model of reading. And in this paper, he laid out the idea that every aspect of our interpretation of what what's coming off the page when we read at every level of analysis you can think of actually depends on all the other levels of analysis. So what are the actual pixels making up each letter? And what do those pixels signify about which letters they are? And what do those letters tell us about what words are there, and what do those words tell us about what ideas the author is trying to convey? And so he had this model where, you know, we have these little tiny uh, elements that represent each of the pixels of each of the letters and then other ones that represent the line segments in them and other ones that represent the letters and other ones that represent the words. And um, at that time, his idea was there's this set of experts. There's an expert about how to construct a line out of pixels and another expert about how which sets of lines go together to make which letters and another one about which letters go together to make which words and another one about what the meanings of the words are and another one about how the meanings fit together and you know things like that and all these experts are looking at this data and they're they're um updating hypotheses at at other levels so the word expert can tell the letter expert oh i think there should be a t there because i think there should be a word the here and the bottom up sort of feature to letter expert could say i think there should be a t there too and if they agree then you see a t right and so this is a top down bottom up interactive process but it's going on at all layers simultaneously so everything can filter all the way down from the top as well as all the way up from the bottom and it's a completely interactive bidirectional parallel distributed process that okay? is somehow because of the abstractions is hierarchical so like yeah so there's different layers of responsibilities different levels of responsibilities first of all it's fascinating to think about it in this kind of mechanistic way so not thinking purely 
from the structure of a neural network or something like a neural network, but thinking about these little little guys that work on letters and then the letters <laughs> come words and words become sentences. Yeah. And, and uh, th that's a very interesting hypothesis that from that kind of hierarchical structure can emerge uh, understanding. Yeah. So, but the thing is though, I wanna just sort of relate this to the earlier part of the conversation. Sure. Um, when Rommel Hart was first thinking about it, there were these experts on the side, one for the features and one for the letters and one for how the letters make the words and so on. And, and they would each be working, sort of evaluating various propositions about, you know, is this combination of features here going to be one that looks like the letter T and so on. And, and what he realized kind of after reading Hinton's dissertation and hearing about Jim Anderson's um, linear algebra-based neural network models that I was telling you about before was that he could replace those experts with neuron-like processing units, which just would have their connection weights that would do this job. So there, so what ended up happening was that Rommel Hart and I got together and we created a model called the Interactive Activation Model of Letter Perception, uh -huh. which is takes these little pixel level uh, inputs, constructs uh, line segment features, letters and words, but now we built it out of a set of neuron-like processing units that are just connected to each other with connection weights. So the unit for the word time has a connection to the unit for the letter T in the first position and the letter I in the second position, so on. And because these connections are bidirectional, if you have prior knowledge that it might be the word time, that starts to prime the feature, to the letters and the features. And if you don't, then it's, it has to start bottom up. But the directionality just depends on where the information comes in first. And, it, and if you have context together with features at the same time, they can convergently result in an emergent perception. And that, um, that was the, um, the piece of work that we did together that uh, sort of got us both completely convinced that you know this neural network way of thinking was going to be able to actually address the questions that we were interested in as cognitive psychologists. So the algorithmic side, the optimization side, those are all details. Like when you first start, the idea that you can get far with this kind of way of thinking, that in itself is a profound idea.